Now, welcome, Dr. Chris Smith. It's good to have you back. Morning. I've been Morning. reading this story, um, which is out making the rounds this morning. Scientists say they might be about to discover the fifth fourth force of nature. And I remember us talking about this, not you and me personally, but us on the radio talking about this about two years ago. Because scientists announced that they were doing these studies with particles called muons, which are nothing to do with cats. They're like heavy electrons. They're about 200 times heavier than an electron, but they're also negatively charged. And when scientists put them in a magnetic field, they don't behave as though the rules of physics say they should. There's something adrift. And this has been corroborated now over a sequence of, of many, many experiments, giving the, the scientists a lot more confidence that, that they're onto something. So they don't know why this is happening, but it could be, say, dark matter. It could be some other force of nature, which we hadn't previously identified, which could be part of the puzzle of our understanding of the fabric of the universe, which is about to fall into place. It's really exciting. Big step forward in physics potentially coming our way. Absolutely. And I think I was actually listening to you when you discussed that right here on Cape Talk about two years ago, except I was in my car. Um, yeah, so watch that development. I think muons have been employed in, in a couple of ways already. Uh, we'll leave that for another day. To your questions, if you don't mind, Dr. Smith, the first one reads, um, and I think uh, it's some bait. They want to they wanna drag you down a rabbit hole. Let's see if you go. Dear Dr. Chris Smith, as a scientist, what is your personal opinion on whether the moon landing did indeed take place in 1969? And what is the obsession and benefit to mankind in going to the moon? Uh, Maurice out in Paddo with that question. Hello, Maurice. Well, the answer is it, it certainly did happen. There are so many independent strands of evidence, not least the 300 plus kilos of moon rock that we have to analyse on the Earth brought back by those moon missions, as well as the mirror which is sitting on the surface of the moon, which scientists are able to beam a laser onto and reflect back from each day which is how we know, for example, the moon is moving a couple of centimetres farther away from the Earth every year. Uh, there are various reasons why that's happening. But there is, there's too much evidence that we did go to the moon rather than didn't. And there would have been so many thousands of people involved in that sort of fakery and the Soviet Union were so desperate at the time to disprove or undermine anything the Americans did to win the space race for themselves that were it as simple as saying it was all made up, someone would have flushed it out by now. So I'm very, very strongly of the opinion that the moon landings were absolutely real. Why is there an obsession with the moon? Well, apart from being a, an interesting challenge, why do people go to the top of Everest? Because it's there, as, as was said famously about going to space and going to the moon. It is there. It, it's a challenge to overcome. It stresses the system. And in that way, new learning can take place. So there's a simple human endeavour aspect to this. But there's also the fact that the moon has some interesting geology and it has interesting resources, and it's a lot smaller than the Earth. And for that reason, if we want to have a jumping off point where we want to go and visit other places more sustainably, then why overcome the Earth's gravity every time we want to get something off the planet's surface? If we start from the Moon, which has enormous amounts of raw materials and things that we could use to build stations and ships and, and fuel them, then we're, f we're confronted by a much smaller challenge in terms of getting off the surface of that body because the gravity is a fifth of what it is on the Earth. And so in sustainability terms, it, it makes enormous sense. Next question from Ivan in Plumstead. Why does a flame not give a shadow? Uh, Ivan, first of all, what's a flame? And, and actually flames do produce a sort of shadow. Um, it's, it's not strictly true to say they don't. But a flame is hot gas. When you burn something, that thing that's burning is evolving or producing vapour. And that vapour is a fuel which is mixing with an oxidising agent, which if you burn in room air is the oxygen in room air. And it produces heat. And when it produces heat, it makes particles of unburnt fuel glow an orange colour if you've got, say, a log or a piece of coal burning. Or if you're burning, say, natural gas, methane or propane, it burns a blue colour because the bonds between the carbon and the oxygen that you're making and breaking in that flame absorb and release energy, which is at the blue end of the spectrum. The flame is giving out energy and, and light, which we can see, and therefore doesn't appear to have a shadow because it's brighter than the thing that's around it. But in fact, if you do look very carefully, you can see a sort of shadow because the gas that comes off is very rich in CO2, and this will rise above the flame 
And if you shine light through it, because it distorts the the path of light, because the CO2 and, and being hot as well, it will have a slightly different density than the surrounding room air, it will cause light to bend at, at a different rate than the room air, and therefore the light will travel at a different speed than it will through the room air. And this means you can actually see a shadow or imprint on a, a structure behind the flame of the outline of the or profile of that flame. You can do it. And I think there's a bit of an experiment that Ivan's going to put to the test in Plumstead. Thank you for that question. Naked scientist. Hi, Dr. Chris. Why do I find it so difficult to fall asleep when I'm not sleeping at home? I travel regularly and always struggle with sleeping, says Ashley. Hi, Ashley. This is a common phenomenon. And scientists have recently, in the last five years or so, published papers on why you don't get a good night's sleep the night you go away and you're spending your first night away from home. And it seems that the brain remains much more active when we are in a hostile or foreign environment compared to when we are experiencing the creature comforts of home. This is probably an evolved or evolutionary self-preservation mechanism, whereby when we find ourselves in unusual or unfamiliar circumstances, the level of vigilance and arousal that goes on in our nervous system is higher. So you stay almost sleeping with one eye half open to guard against danger. And you can imagine why that would be very useful historically when we weren't sleeping in a hotel, but you were sleeping in the middle of nowhere and something was trying to turn you into its dinner. But when we've entered the modern era where we do have nice beds and hotel rooms to sleep in, you nevertheless still struggle sometimes because your brain still thinks you're that there in the veld and uh, you need to defend against all comers. OK, there's that question answered, Ashley. Uh, naked scientist, um, if using... Zeolite, a form of volcanic rock, as a pool filtration instead of usual sand. Uh, will this cause a, a, magnet, a magnetic reaction in water, which could affect a pacemaker in a swimmer? That's I wouldn't have thought so. I wouldn't have thought so. Zeolites are, are small particles of, as the name, as the person says, they're, they're small particles of rock. And they are basically bits of sand. And the way that a sand filter works on a swimming pool is that by putting the sand into the filter and blowing the water through the sand and then collecting it through what are called laterals, which are small structures that lie horizontally underneath the bed of sand but have a porous layer around them. The water has to go through the sand, through the gaps between the sand particles, and then through the laterals to get back into the swimming pool, or whatever you're filtering. And in this way, the dirt gets trapped in all the tiny particles in the sand, um, around the particles in the sand, and gets left behind because the dirt is bigger than the water. Anything pretty much would do that. Um, it just depends on how big the dirt is that you're trying to trap. And there shouldn't be any kind of magnetic impact on water. Water doesn't work like that. While, while you can pass a magnetic field a short distance through water, it's not going to do anything to the water apart from perhaps have some impact on some of the dissolved salts and so on. It might, might produce an electric current or something. But there is no evidence that that's going to change the water fundamentally. And by the time it got back to the swimming pool, uh, you would have no measurable difference in the water that had been over zeolite particles or uh, more traditional beach sand that you were using in your filter. Uh, this question in sometime in 2029, an asteroid called Apophis uh, will come extremely close to Earth. Hypothetic or well, recently scientists have determined that it will not hit Earth. Um, can it hit the moon and what will happen if it hits the moon? I think a hypothetical question. Well, we're monitoring these so-called NEOs or near-Earth objects because, of course, there is a chance that things will slam into the Earth and we know that in the past this has occurred with catastrophic consequences. At the time of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago, something pretty enormous, city-sized, smashed into the planet and it unleashed so much energy that it changed the climate and wiped out a whole host of life. More recently, the Chelyabinsk impactor came in over Chelyabinsk in Russia and this was about the size of a house and fragmented into lots of pieces, produced shockwaves, smashed lots of windows and made a hole in the ice in Lake Chelyabinsk in Russia. So these things do come, they do arrive and there are measures in place to keep an eye on them, plot them, track them and predict their trajectory so that we can work out whether or not they really do pose a threat. And at the moment, we're comfortable that there's nothing which is on a direct earthbound course. Or are we? Because a year or so ago, NASA announced this thing called the DART mission. 
And DART was a mission to determine whether or not we could change the trajectory of a potential near-Earth object on an Earth-bound course by detecting it well in advance, sending something to it and blowing it out of the way. And to test the theory, they sent an impactor, a craft, went all the way to a to an asteroid which is called Dimorphos and this has a tiny moon going around it called Didymos and sorry I've said that the wrong way around the asteroid's Dimorphos the moon's Didymos and they slammed the impactor into this and they were using the the orbit of the moon as a way to measure whether or not they had affected the trajectory of the parent body this appears to have worked great news if there is an impactor on an earthbound course looks like we can now deflected. Problem is, in doing the experiment they did, they've produced a whole bunch of fragments, which we now think might be on an earthbound course, hopefully not arriving anytime soon. So we may have turned a non-problem, determining whether or not we can solve the problem of an earthbound asteroid into a whole sequence of earthbound asteroids. Let's hope they're not coming our way soon. I've got two callers, Harmony and Anton. Um, we're going to go to both of you, ask you a question, and then if you don't mind, maybe you want to listen to the answers uh, on your wireless. Harmony, let's go to, to you first. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Dr. Chris. My question is, I have a family. Um, my husband, when we just swim, sinks like a brick if he stops moving. I can float. My sister-in-law can sit in water, any water, and read a book. She floats so well. And of my children, two of them float and one sinks. Why is this? Thanks for your question, Harmony. Let's go to Anton. Anton, your question? Everything is made up of atoms. And electrons and, and protons and neutrons, they all help together by electricity. I mean, it's a minuscule amount of electricity. So why... If you want to lift the car up in the scrapyard, you've got a, like 2,000 volts for an electromagnet. How can such a tiny voltage can hold a piece of steel together and you can't break it? It wasn't a quality line. Let's just check that Dr. Smith did in fact get that question. Uh, well, two quite different questions. I, I did get both of them. Well, let's do the swimming one first because the reason anything floats, it's all to do with density. Something which is less dense than the thing it's in will float. So a piece of wood goes into water and it takes up more space and therefore pushes out of the way a bigger volume of water in weight terms than it itself weighs. This means the water pushes back harder on the thing that's pushing the water out of the way than the thing is pushing down and as a result it will float. And this is why anything floats, a boat through to a stick that you throw into a river. So a person who goes into a swimming pool, when they're in the pool, what is happening is that they are pushing out of the way a volume of water which is directly proportional to how big their body is. Now if you weigh that amount of water and then compare how big the amount of body that's pushed that amount of water is in weight terms, if you've pushed out of the way more water than that bit of your body weighs, then the water's pushing back on you harder than you're pushing on it, so you will float. So the, the shape of your body and what you're made of makes a very big difference. If your body is made up with a very high composition of bone and muscle, which are very high density, they take up not very much space for a lot of weight, then the amount of water they're moving out of the way is not going to be very high, therefore they're going to have a lower, uh, higher density and they're going to sink Whereas if your body is made up of a lot of fat, for example, and I'm not making any aspersions about the person in Harmony who asked the question, but if you have a greater distribution of fat, fat is less dense than because it's oily and oil floats on water. We know that and that's why oil floats on water. It takes up a lot more space, so therefore it's pushing out of the way a lot more water, therefore it's pushing out of the way a bigger mass of water which is going to push you up more. So Given that men and women tend to have a different distribution of body fat, women on average carry more fat than men, and there's an evolved reason for that. Women get pregnant, they have children, they breastfeed them. You need a greater reserve of body fat in order to nurture a pregnancy and then nurture with breast milk a growing baby. For this reason, nature favours women having a higher proportion of body fat than males on average and for that reason women are more likely to be floaters compared to men who are more likely to be sinkers 
The second uh, question. Second, and we don't have a lot of time, please, Dr. Chris, we'll appreciate it. The second question, which concerns what holds atoms together. Well, it's true that there is a force inside atoms and that there is an electrical effect between atoms. But what holds the nucleus of an atom, which is where the vast majority of the mass of an atom is, because the electrons that are the negative bits and, and are around the outside of the atom, they don't weigh very much. But the core of the atom, the nucleus, where the protons and the neutrons are, those are bound together by something called the nuclear force. And the, these nuclear forces are what we actually exploit when we have an atom bomb because you are forming new attractions or you're breaking apart attractions inside the nucleus. Either way, you're liberating energy, and that's how an atom bomb works. So it is not electricity so much as a nuclear force, which is conveyed by force carriers, particles, structures which we know about in our standard atomic model, which bind atoms together. And it is electrostatic interactions between atoms that hold atoms as separate entities together. So it's slightly more complicated than just saying electricity holds all this matter together.